This man is the victim of an IRA kneecapping. He's been shot in both legs. Shootings like this form part of a macabre ritual. The victim is ordered to turn up at a certain time and a certain place to receive his punishment. If he failed to turn up, he could face even harsher treatment. Within a few hours, he'll undergo emergency surgery to save his life. He's the latest in a steady stream of gunshot victims to arrive in the casualty unit of the Mater Hospital. The Mater is an inner city hospital coping with the everyday pressures of any national health service hospital, but in addition, it has to deal with the continuing bloodshed and violence of North Belfast. Here, more people have been killed and injured as a result of the troubles than any other part of Northern Ireland. On average, over the last couple of years, we would certainly see a gunshot wound every week, perhaps every four or five days. Uh, I think over the last two and a half years, we've seen about 150. World in Action spent seven days inside the Mater Hospital. We talked to the people directly affected by the violence, the doctors, nurses and victims themselves. All of them live or work in a hospital serving an area known by local people as the Killing Zone. with the future and live on the past. May the Lord in his mercy be kind to Belfast. After 20 years of the troubles, much of Belfast remains a city at war. The Mater Infamorum Hospital was founded in 1883 as a Catholic voluntary hospital. Today, it maintains this Catholic ethos even though it became part of the National Health Service in the 1970s. The Mater is a front-line hospital. It stands on the Crumlin Road, which divides North Belfast into its religious ghettos. To the left of the road is the Protestant stronghold of the Shankill. To the right, the Catholic strongholds of the Ardoin and New Lodge. Where we're situated places us in the middle of a, a, a litany of names of districts where violence has been endemic now for well over 20 years. Ardoin, the New Lodge Road, the Antrim Road, the Crumlin Road, parts of the Shankill Road, Glen Cairn. All these names must be familiar to people. And it's from those areas that we receive a constant stream of people, um, gunshots, bomb victims, uh, punishment, um, injuries, things of that kind. Regularly, we, we see these things. Saturday night in the accident and emergency unit. Like any other casualty ward in Britain, the matter handles the usual run-of-the-mill cases. Victims of domestic accidents or violence, strokes, heart attacks, drunks. So far, it's been an average day. We started this morning at about uh, 7.45 with the admission of uh, two people from a road accident, one of whom was quite seriously hurt. We've seen a tremendous variety of patients since then, ranging from minor dog bites and cuts uh, through people with chest infections, with uh, chest pain. 8.50 in the evening and the casualty unit goes on alert. The police have reported that a badly wounded man has been found on waste ground nearby. Go ahead, Bill. 46-year-old Robert Smith is the victim of a punishment shooting. He's been found in a Protestant area, so it's likely he's suffered at the hands of the outlawed Ulster Volunteer Force. Punishment shootings are the work of the paramilitaries from both sides of the religious divide. It's the usual sentence for crimes such as stealing cars, theft or womanising. So far this year, there's been a huge increase in kneecappings. The current figure for 1989 is double the number for the same period in 1988. Although they're called kneecappings, the vast majority aren't actually uh, injuries to the knee. Uh, they're usually above or below the knee. And uh, in that particular case, you're dealing with uh, a bony injury, i.e. a fracture above or below the knee. 
However, if, if the, the bullet uh, actually does hit the knee, um, you can get into various problems because there are some very important structures running through the back of the knee and often require uh, emergency and fairly intricate surgery. So some people will be uh, some residual deficit for life. To overcome their fear and certain pain, many of the victims drink heavily before they're shot. But their intoxicated condition can lead to complications for the doctors in the casualty unit. Hello. You awake there? This man has had quite a lot to drink by the looks of him. Um, and uh, that will tend to mask his symptoms and complicate the situation. Uh, if we, on top of that, gave him pain-killing medication, uh, it complicates the situation even further. However, he was uh, starting to obviously be in a good deal of pain, so the decision was made to give him uh, painkillers. Right. Yeah. 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 You're in the matter casually on the Crumlin Road. Okay. Robert Smith was the victim of a particularly severe assault. In all, he's been shot four times. He has a wound in each hand, which I would not think of themselves are likely to cause us any great problems in terms of treatment. Uh, he has wounds in both thighs, just above the knee. Uh, the circulation in the legs at this moment in time appears to be okay. He's pulsing in both feet, which is a good sign. However, he's complaining of uh, some lack of feeling in his right leg, which raises the possibility that one of the major nerves has been damaged uh, by this bullet as it passed through his leg. An hour after his arrival in casualty, Robert's hands and legs were x-rayed. The results were alarming. What had seemed to be just nasty flesh wounds had turned into something far more disturbing. These are the x-rays of his uh, left thigh bone. Uh, the bone has been pretty well shattered. So he's quite a serious bony injury there. Uh, there are probably also little bits of the bullet as well in the tissues. Sunday morning. Twelve hours after being admitted with gunshot wounds, Robert was taken to the operating theatre. The surgeon in charge, Stuart Ross. He has a fracture just really above the knee. Uh, it has been contaminated by the passage of a bullet through it. And for all those reasons, it's a worrying fracture and one that we would need to pay special attention to. The purpose of what we've been doing this morning is twofold. One, to uh, prevent his leg from moving and therefore to reduce the pain from his fracture site and that's the purpose really of the splint and secondly to position the fracture position the leg uh, in such a way as to make it uh, the correct length and, the, and as straight as possible so that when the fracture heals his leg will look and, and function normally we would hope that this would not get infected and it should heal. But it will take some two to three months to heal up entirely. Robert is one of the 68 gunshot victims admitted to the matter in the last 18 months. Of those 68, 12 died, either in casualty or in the operating theatre. In the matter's surgical ward is one of the lucky survivors. John Rogers spent 12 days in intensive care after gunmen singled him out as a sectarian target. He had five different gunshot wounds. There were two wounds, one in the region of the buttock and one in the region of his back and the right side of his back. And there were three other wounds in the region of his shoulder, his right elbow, and this shows an X-ray showing a missile wound in relation to his right elbow. He got two wounds, at least involving his abdomen, and his blood pressure was falling, and he was dying, if you want to put it that way, in casual apartment. John Rogers is a victim of the wave of sectarian tit-for-tat shootings which have swept across Belfast. A Catholic labourer, he was renovating a house when a car with four men pulled up nearby. The man in the front passenger seat had a, a mask on and I seen mo movement as if he was going to find and I just ran and I, I heard the door opening or something and I threw the axe so it sort of behind me and I never looked back and just run and run. And I got, I heard two shots and then I got a bulk of force hit me and I fell over and then there was more shooting and I felt myself being hit and all I 
two times and then I didn't know whether I was being hit or not. During the operation he was given, I think, 18 units of blood. I mean, a normal person has about 10 pints of blood. Uh, over, the, over the following few days he needed more blood. I think he was given a total of 26 units of blood. So he needed his blood volume replaced twice over. Why were you a target, do you know? I would say that the knew that if I was working on that street that I was a Catholic, like it was, you could be 100% sure, you know. John Rogers has recovered from his horrific stomach wounds, but the damage to his arm and hand may lead to some permanent disablement. I lost my job, like, and uh, it was the first job I'd had here for a long time. I was trying to see the fries and the, all the mortgage, and me and the girlfriend were sort of take, starting to take a look in poverty places and things. And all of this just because you happen to be a Catholic in the wrong place? Yeah, I would say so. Ironically, in the next war to John Rogers is a Protestant shot by Republican paramilitaries. Sammy Miller is engaged in a daily battle for survival after an assassination attempt on his life eight years ago. A former member of the Ulster Defence Association and a Belfast City councillor, he was a high-profile politician targeted by the outlawed INLA, the Irish National Liberation Army. In March 1981, two hooded gunmen burst into his house in the Shankill. The front pushed the front door and just started opening up all around the house. And I was hit five times and there was 14 bullets in the wall, dum-dums. The thumb downs are a bullet that explodes inside you and they've left me paralyzed for the rest of my life from the chest down. They took more or less the bottom end of my body completely away. The lead was in the bloodstream. It got in the joints of the bones which had been cut away and they took a muscle out of here and they placed it into the hub. In the wards of the matter, Catholic and Protestant victims recuperate side by side. Outside, there would be suspicion and hostility. Inside, illness and suffering seem to bind the different religious groups together. This hospital is a home to me, and religion doesn't come into it. Religion does not come in. I'm in this ward. There's Catholics in this ward. I'm friends with those people. I have a smoke with those people. They give me a smoke. I'm a share where biscuits and so forth, where papers, you know, we get on great, magnificent. Are there occasions where you would have people from, say, the IRA in the same ward as you'd have people from UDA or whatever? In the broad sense, uh, yes, we, we, we've had that. Uh, we've had uh, patients attending uh, and becoming very friendly, attending as outpatients, and their relatives being uh, out on the corridor waiting for them to come out and the nurses having to keep them separate and then eventually find there was no necessity for this, that people were quite friendly in the neutral ground or the, you, you called it the uh, common ground or something of the hospital. Yes, that happened. This coexistence between Catholics and Protestants is even more remarkable because the matter makes no secret of its Catholic origins. It rigidly sticks to the church's beliefs in the sanctity of human life. Here, there are no abortions, no sterilizations, and no euthanasia. The most visible expression of its Catholic status is inside the matter's maternity unit. A nun, Sister Kathleen Gill, looks after newborn babies from both sides of the religious divide. In all the ten years I've been here, I can't say I've ever received any hostility from any patients, or in fact from any visitors either. Patients who come in who haven't had any dealings with nuns before realize that I'm just an ordinary person, an ordinary nurse. It's quite often the first time that they've had any communication perhaps with Catholics, especially husbands. Quite often mothers do through children and that, but husbands quite often don't have that. Most of the babies born in the matter are from the Protestant Shankill. Their mothers are often too frightened to cross the city to the other NHS hospitals in Belfast. The Catholic matter has become their own hospital. The matter's very popular in the Shankill. In fact, it's very hard to get into. 
um, everybody seems to book in here. I think it is the atmosphere that's the main attraction. That's great. Everybody's friendly. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I get on with everybody. People talk, and religion doesn't really come into it. I think it brings down religious barriers because, I mean, you're getting on with Catholics while you're here, and I mean, it's they're only born. This is a place to start. The hospital enjoys the status of an oasis in the war-torn district of North Belfast. But if religious barriers are often broken down inside the wards, the divide between Catholics and Protestants soon reappears. Outside the hospital, everybody goes back to their own area. Maybe some fellow will say, I'll keep in touch with you, you know. Well, the only way he can keep in touch with you is really by phone. Because of fear. It's just the way things are here in Northern Ireland. It's really boils down to fear. Fear is a great problem. This fear and tension has even made the matter itself a target for the warring factions. Last year, a gunman tried to kill a group of Catholic builders working on the construction of a new wing at the hospital. The odd bullet hole is a reminder that from time to time, the hospital has been caught in the crossfire. We had the first member of medical staff, a senior consultant, now retired, to be shot on his way to the hospital one morning. We had the first patient actually shot within our wards. Uh, Maura Drum, the late uh, president or senior figure anyway in Sinn Féin, was a patient and was shot there in front of other patients. And finally, perhaps macabre, is the one where a baby was shot while still in its mother's womb. The lady was brought into the hospital, delivered by cesarean section, and the baby taken to the children's hospital where it was treated for its gunshot wound. Mr. French. Even doctors and nurses are not immune from the bloodshed of Belfast. Mark Gormley is a consultant physician working in the medical wards of the matter. In 1972, his father, an eye specialist at the hospital, was taking three of his sons to a Catholic school. Their route took them through the Protestant shank into Downing Street, just a few hundred yards from the matter. As he was driving along this street, my father was first aware of the windscreen breaking. And I think it took him a short while to realize that they were under fire. And one brother, Paul, had a gunshot wound to his left arm, which fractured his humerus. He was sitting in the left-hand side, roughly the first in line from the direction of fire. And the, then my father lost control of the car as he got a flesh wound to his left uh, shoulder. The Gormley family abandoned the car and ran for cover, but one of the sons had been badly injured. At this stage, Rory was very pale, and my father had, uh, was holding him and, and knew that he was dying. By that stage, the resuscitation was unsuccessful. Uh, he really died on the way to the hospital. The inquest was told that the gunmen were no more than 16. Rory Gormley himself was just 14. Today, Mark Gormley regularly makes home visits to the sick. Many of them take him into the heart of the Protestant Shankill, close to the spot where his young brother was murdered. Is there any other times you would sweat? There was no feeling of uh, bitterness or anger. I mean, we did not see his killers as representatives of loyalists or Protestants or unionists. But I don't think it made the grief any less. I think it um, perhaps ultimately le leads you to, to be less bitter and frustrated, if you like. So you're saying in a way that the fact it happened in Northern Ireland you were almost prepared for it. Yes, I think that's probably true in a sense, in a certain sense. We're all aware of, of a certain risk of death by violence. Nurse Paula Mullally, too, was aware of the possible risk of death in her family. In February this year, while on duty at the matter, she was told she had to prepare herself for some bad news. There'd been an accident, something to do with the car. Of course, my immediate reaction was that it had been a car bomb or something had happened. Why did you think instantly of... Because my car? father was a policeman and it's uh, 
Something in life, you're always worried about car bombs, shootings. You're always very security conscious in yourself. It might seem silly, but you check cars going out in the morning times. And um, my father, he wouldn't check the cars as often as I would. But um, I just knew. And I was waiting for the 20 minutes to actually it was confirmed. It was very hard. It's very hard. Paula's father, Gabriel Mullally, a 54-year-old Catholic, was a retired RUC detective. A widower with six children, he died instantly when an IRA bomb exploded under his car. Two years earlier, he'd received a chilling warning that he was a terrorist target. A fake obituary for him was placed in the Belfast Telegraph. What was his reaction to that? <laughs> well, it down. He played it down. I don't really know actually what his own reaction was because he would never have said to us. But he laughed at it at the time and said that it was very rare for someone to have an insight into their own funeral. But I'm sure it did very much worry him because it worried us a lot. Unlike most other victims, Paula Mullally faces the daily dilemma that she could come into contact or be required to give medical help to her father's killers. Well, I often thought about it. You realise that sometime in your life you're going to, because Belfast is such a small place, that you're going to bump into these people, whether it be in the hospital or where. And indeed, I'm very angry for the people that did it. But had I ever to nurse the people, I would look after them in a way that I would look after anybody else. How, and how could you do that? I don't know. You just have to do it. It's probably in my personality that I would. I would prefer not to know that they were the people, but if they were the people, I would look after them as best I could. There's no point in being bitter, despite what's happened to us. It doesn't give us the right to turn around and be bitter, because if everyone's to think like that in Northern Ireland, who's experienced some form of... Um, of uh, kind of murder or whatever, it, it, all of it does in the end is intensify the situation. And, and bitters. And, and embitters people and it widens the whole kind of, the whole wound in Northern Ireland. It, it doesn't cure anything at all. What does revenge prove? I mean, it's really only a tit for tat thing in the end. Kill a Catholic, kill a Protestant, it's returned. Belfast and its people have experienced these high levels of violence for 20 years. The psychiatric unit at the matter has conducted a series of studies into the effects of the troubles. The results are surprising, yet they confirm what so many of the victims we filmed told us. This is the most resilient community in the world outside of Beirut. People survive, people don't break down, people are exposed to awful things here. But somehow the vast majority cope get over and carry on. Our drug taking is no more than England. Our prescription of drugs I'm talking about. Alcohol, attempted suicide, the rates of referral to the likes of me or colleagues, admissions to mental hospitals are falling here just as they have in England. So no matter what crude parameter you take of mental health or mental ill health, we actually are surviving. Of course, that's the whole story of Belfast. We're prepared for it. And always have been prepared for it ever since we were children. But, um, I suppose anybody living in Northern Ireland, you are prepared, in a way. You walk round the corner and possibly a bomb go off or a shooting. It's just part of life, really. Back in the casualty ward, the staff are again faced with more shootings. Two men have been found in a Republican area near the hospital. Both have gunshot wounds to their legs. Bear with them for a wee second, all right? They look to be low-velocity uh, handgun injuries, which in general are not as bad as the high-velocity wounds. Um, they appear to be through and through flesh wounds or soft tissue injuries. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any obvious bony involvement, but, but, but we'll be uh, taking x-rays just to check in that. They'll be admitted to the surgical wards. Probably shortly after that, sometime in the next few hours, they'll go to the operating theatre.